Hey, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Great. Good to see you. Everybody's happy. You ever notice in church, it kind of gets heavy towards the back of the room? Yeah. Ever, ever know that? Anybody know why? You know, you know what I think it is? I think it's because you guys have such amazing hearts. You know, the Bible talks about you don't want the preferred seats. So you guys all sit to the back. Is that, is that right? Is that why? <laughs> You're like, no, if I can get out of here faster, dude. Anyway, I like to give you a hard time. I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, I, I'm excited to share with you some things, so I'm not going to mess around and get started this morning. So thank you for being here and sharing your Sunday with us. And Jesse, that was funny. I can see Leslie reacting to that and her reaction thinking it was a crow. That ought to be a new phrase right here. Was that a crow? That ought to be our new thing that we say. You know what I mean? Just come up with our own little phrase. Someone says, what was that? Was that a crow? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You hear a noise, that's what you say. Is that a crow? People are like, what? Yeah. Anyway, never mind. That's just my generation. Sorry about that. Anyway, let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's close our eyes real quick. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence. And just ask today as we open up our hearts that you would speak to us in ways that only you can. Uh, We ask that we would tune our ears to fix our attention upon you, uh, not on what we can do, but what we can believe. So I pray today that as we hear, that our hearts will begin to absorb and receive what it is that you are saying. So that it's not just memory, or it's not just uh, in our minds the things that we're hearing, but it actually becomes part of our heart. And so we thank you for that today. We thank you for your presence here in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Bless you on the sneeze. Come on. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hey, hey, so have you ever had someone that has blamed you for something? Or took, let me just say it this way. It's probably easier way to say it this way. Have you ever had somebody that has taken the blame for you? Really? So when I was growing up, there's this protocol, friendship protocol, that if you're at your friend's house and something goes south, you have to take the blame for it, right? The, the, the person that lives there takes the blame for it. You know what I'm talking about, right? Because you don't want your friend getting in trouble at your house, right? So the protocol is you take the blame for it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You guys probably didn't have that protocol. We had that protocol. You know, it's your house. You take the blame. Why? Because you don't want your buddy getting in trouble. You want him to come over again. So I, one time I was at a friend of mine. His name was Dane. I won't get his last name. Some of you probably know who Dane was. But Dane had like everything when you were growing up. You're like, he's the guy's house you went to. He had three wheelers, you know, and, and he had all the latest Jedi, Star Wars stuff. He had a wrestling ring for the WWF guys. He had everything. So you want to go to play at Dane's house. So Dane, at this one time, he got this slingshot. How many of you had a slingshot? Well, it's like 1945 slingshots. Uh, but most slingshots are, you know, just like a little wishbone-looking thing. They have a little thing on it, and you shoot it. Well, that's the, that was my experience with slingshots. Well, I went to Dane's house. Dane whips out this slingshot that has a handle on it, a super band on it, has an arm grabber right here that lays down on your arm so that you can get some leverage. Yes. Was that what it was called? Oh, man, it was bad to the bone. So I'm thinking, well, let's shoot that thing, you know? And so we're out there just firing rocks at everything. Well, we get the idea that let's just shoot them straight up in the air. You know, and then you, then you, try, to, then you try to dodge it when it comes down. Well, it's kind of a cloudy day, so we're whipping these things up in the air. And you can't see them. Once they get up in the air, you're like, holy smokes. And then you're just like, we're going to take one in the head. So I get the, I get the slingshot. I lay back on this thing and I let this dude fly. It literally out of sight. We're like, oh my God. You know how you are when you're a kid? Everything's just um, awesome. You know, this rock goes up there and we're like, yeah. And, we, and all of a sudden we hear this, boom. I'm thinking, you know, it's like, like a gunshot. I, we look over and my rock had went through Dane's mom's back glass on her car. Okay. So if you know Dane's mom, Miss Shirley come flying out of the house. What and she she just chew yeah so she's already chewing us out before she comes out there. What in the world happened? You know, and Dane should have accepted the protocol of like, mom, you know, sorry, I shot we or or she at least he could have said we we shot that up in the air, broke the window. Sorry, but he steps back away from me and points at me and said he did it. I'm just like, 
Nuh uh. You know, I said, nuh uh. Yeah, I'm sure I said, nuh uh, because, you know, I'm like dead. But, you know, look at your neighbor and say, he knows, should know the rules. Come on, tell him. Should know the rules. Should know the rules. And he just sold me out and just did not. And, you know, be honest with you, I should have gotten in trouble for it, right? Because I'm the one that shot the deal. But, you know, at least he could have helped a brother out. <laughs> Stood with me as I walked through the fiery furnace, right? Let's do something together, you know, versus just the good stuff. And so, anyway, I, I say that to say this. And I ask you if any of everybody I need to take the blame for you. You know, we're taught and we believe that, you know, Jesus took the blame for all of our sins, right? He died. You know, and he, he went to the cross, he bore all of that, and, and he was dead for three days, and then he rose from the dead. That's what we're taught. We believe that. So he took the blame for that. Now, what's interesting about that, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to jump in there in just a minute. So he took the blame. Now, here's what's interesting about that. So for, for my fault in what happened, the, 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 the penalty for shooting the rock through the back glass was we got a good tail chewing from his mom. She just chewed us out. You know, irresponsibility, you know, you guys, who's going to pay for that? You know, and all that stuff. How many of you gave that speech before? We don't have the money. And, and, and I just felt terrible. And, and, you know, but that's all the penalty that came from it. Just a tail chewing. You know, but think about this. So for the penalty for all of my sins, just mine, just for me, for my life, would have equaled death like dying and not not that's you know dying physically is not the worst that's not the worst part of this the death that is the worst part of of dying for sin is that it's death actually means separation from life so in the in in the words that they use when they say death you got to think it's more than just no longer having life in this earth it actually means a separation from the life of god now for us it doesn't mean a whole lot because we don't understand what that would look like we only have some examples that we can give to say, hey, look how he responded, and you'll get kind of an idea. Because we'll never understand that in this life. Why? Because God is always here. He's, he's everywhere. He's with us. He's never leaving us. So we experience him, even in our worst conditions, he's always here, so there's not an absence of the presence of God. David wrote it like this, if I go into the depths of the sea, you're there. If I go to the highest place in the heavens, you're there. So he's saying that you're everywhere. So no matter where I go, I will never experience right now that feeling of feeling separated from life, because life is always there, right? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to read this to you, and I want you to I want you to, we're going to grasp the concept because we've been talking about the humanity of Jesus last week, that he was fully human. He stripped himself of being God and became just like us. That made his sacrifice uh, real. You know, if he came as, as God and, and won victory, then what does that mean to us? Because we're still in the condition we were trying to fight this thing out. But he came as a man to show us how a man filled with the Holy Spirit could operate and live victorious in this life. So he's our example. Okay, so we're going to dig into that and understand some things of what he did and how he did those things and why that means so much to us. All right, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. For me, he made him who who was sin to be sin. Let me start over. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that term. He became sin, right? We know that. So now our perspective of that conversation right there is just simply him going to the cross, dying on the cross, dead for three days and raised, right? That is a very, that's like a cliff note version of actually what took place. That's just what happened, but we don't understand uh, truly what was going on during those three days or that time from the cross to the resurrection. That's the most important part of the process for us is what he did and what he accomplished in those three days. Now, I want you to just get this picture. So, you know, whenever you're a kid and you're an adult and you go through something hard, we, we operate different, right? So let me give you an example. So I, how many news I got? I got stung last couple weeks by wasps. Remember I told you about this? Okay, so when I got stung by a wasp when I was a kid, how many of the reactions extremely different? You know, when you're a kid, you get stung. It's like someone shot you. You're crying, you're rolling around on the floor, you're doing all these screaming, how many knows what I'm talking about? You literally felt like you're dying, right? Now when you're an adult and I got stung, I grabbed it immediately, started pinching it. How many knows what I'm talking about? Because that stops the pain. Pressure, right? So I pinch it, and I'm like, holy cow, 
you know. I, I threw some G's Louises out there, you know. I probably called the wasps a lot of names. You know what I'm talking about? But I didn't scream and roll around all over the floor and act like I was dying, right? I said I kind of felt like Trump. I got shot in the ear. That's what I felt like. I was kind of relating to that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but anyway, so, but I, so, so the way that we bear things as we get older, we, re, we respond differently, right? So I didn't roll around on the floor, but I was responding. So why, I'm, why am I saying that? Because when we read about Jesus dying on the cross, we have this perspective like this. That he died on the cross and it was, it was hard for him. It was like a bad day. It was like a rough time for him because he's God. He was an adult, so he acted like an adult. So going to the cross for him was like, you know what? This is not a great day, but it's, I've got this, right? How many of you ever kind of have that perspective? It's okay to be honest because I actually felt like that. I was like, but he is God, so that probably wasn't as hard as, for him it's probably like getting a wasp sting because he's God. You know what I mean? But think about this. He was fully man. So he experienced everything like we did. So I didn't really grasp the full nature of the fact of what that felt like for him to walk through this. So can I kind of dive into this a little bit and kind of give you an idea so we can understand the gravity of, of this, this moment? Because this is the crux of our belief, right? So think about this in your life. Think about, um, anybody ever been depressed? And, 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 and so like you just... You just, you know, the wrong thinking. You got some wrong thinking going on in your mind, which is where depression comes from. Your thinking is wrong. You're thinking about, you're, you're believing something that is not actually real to you. It, it feels real, but it's actually not the truth, right? So you start feeling like this, this hopelessness to the point that it will keep you in bed where you don't even feel like you can get out of it, right? And that's just because I got dumped by a girlfriend. I'm not, really, I'm not, I didn't, I'm just saying that, right? So that magnitude of that holds me captive where I can't get out of that bed and find any hope that anything good's gonna happen. You with me so far? So imagine that every wrong thinking that you ever had, that you bore all of those at the same time. Think about that, how heavy that would be. If that keeps me in, in, in bondage where I can't hardly do anything. Think about if everything I ever messed up on hit me all at once. What could I do? I'd be done, right? So now I need you to imagine this. Imagine that every mistake that was ever made or ever would be made and the effects of those decisions coming on one man at one moment. And think about the weight of that. Like, I, I don't, I've never thought about that. I don't know if you ever have, but I've never thought about that. Because I know the weight of one situation in my life keeps me out of it. It may keep me down for days, maybe weeks. Can you imagine if all of them came at once? Can you imagine every, you, know, you ever tried to, you ever like went with a friend through something and you're kind of carrying it with them and how hard that is and you're like, oh my gosh, I got my own problems. I can't hardly carry theirs. Can you imagine carrying the problems for every single one of them? If you have more than one kid, you probably try to carry the weight of your kids. Stresses you out, right? You got gray hair faster than you ever would. Why? Because you're carrying the weight of something. Can you imagine carrying the weight of all mankind for all times, every single thing that would happen, the penalty for everything that would happen in one body at one moment, at one time? Let me read that one more time. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Didn't it say he, he, he was the representation of sin? It said he actually became sin. He became that. Now let's dig in because that's going to get even more, right? It's going to get even deeper. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. That means this. He became AIDS. He became cancer. He became every sexual assault, every child abuse that would ever take place. He became every divorce, every act of adultery. He became every lie that was ever spoken. He became every single thing that could ever be done that was missing the way it should be. And he bore not only the mistake, he bore the consequence of the mistake. Think about that. He became AIDS. See, it's, let me, can I say it this way? That's not, that's not really popular to want to think like that. It's not popular to think that that's actually what he did. 
Because like, once again, it's like, I, wanted, I really want to just grasp it that he just kind of had a rough day and he just was just kind of struggling a little bit, got a little blood going down inside of his mouth. You know, it was just off. Like he got stung by a wasp that day. But that's not what the picture is. The picture is he became sin. Now, how could I qualify that? Go to Isaiah chapter 53. So all through the Bible, there are prophetic, they're called messianic prophecies that point to Jesus that were spoken hundreds and hundreds of years before he ever existed. Okay, so I want you, here's one of them. This is Isaiah 53. This is verse three and four. He was despised and rejected by man, by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we laid as it were our, our face from, as we hid, sorry, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse four. Surely he has borne our griefs. Now, if you look in your, in your Bible, a lot of times it'll translate these. That word griefs is actually the word sicknesses. He has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. The word sorrows is pain. Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised. That word bruised means crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That was verse 5. So notice that he was showing us that he said he bore our sicknesses. That means that he carried all the sicknesses, like I was describing, in his body on that tree at one time. Can I tell you this way? It wasn't because he was crucified on the cross. Can I, can I tell you this why? Because there was a bunch of people crucified on the cross back in those times. That was part of their process of punishment. But he was the only one that went as an innocent lamb to carry the sin of the world. So he died on the cross. See, many times we'll say it was just being hung on a cross that was the process. That wasn't what you're going to find out see even more here in just a moment how the power of this is. But it was for the sins of the world that he hung on the cross. All right, go to verse 10 of that same chapter. Are you guys ready for this? Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him or crush him. Now, this is, this, some of these things are hard for me to kind of understand. Watch this. He had put, on, he had put him to grief. Then you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, this is said, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Think about that. And they use the word crush like you would crush an olive for olive oil. It pleased the Lord to crush him, to make him a penalty for our sin. Look at verse five. I'm gonna read that same verse I just read. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by this crushing or this bruising, we are healed. Now, this is interesting because we've been taught that it was the Romans that brought about this. That word, uh, that, that's where we equate it. But this interesting thing is it has to be scriptural, right? So who did he say did the crushing? The Romans or the bruising? Who did the crushing? God did the crushing. He said it pleased him to bruise him. See, we want to equate that the stripes he took was the actual stripe. That, remember, that word's not even stripes, it's actual bruisings. His bruisings, we're healed. So it helps us to equate that. That part of that process of flogging was just part of this, him being just rejected and beaten to pieces. But what caused us to receive what he did for us was God crushing him for our mistakes. Come on, just... Think about that. It wasn't the Romans punishing him. Don't give them the credit. It was because God put on him the crushing that belonged on me. Isn't that good? It's hard for us to see. It's like, oh, that's just kind of rough. But, but the thing about it, this is why it's so freeing to us. Because he was crushed. And by that bruising, we are healed. So he bore all of the sicknesses that would ever be. And the effects of those sicknesses so we could be healed. He carried them already, so you and I don't have to ever carry them again. What happens if sickness comes? Listen, in the world, sickness will come. Why? Because there's a sin principle in the world, meaning this, that because sin is still in the world, there will be effects from it. That means that you're gonna fight viruses and things like that, but here's the difference. We can deny the fact that it has a right to be in us. Why? Because of what Jesus paid for us. Isn't that good news? 
Because what it tells us, what, this, what, what we want to believe in the church is we have no power over anything. It's just whatever comes your direction, that's God's will. Can I tell you that is not scriptural? Because if it's against what God says and what he went to the cross and what he was buried for and what he's resurrected through, then it is not for us. Otherwise, why did he become crushed if we're still going to be crushed? Are you with me on this this morning? Because that's good news, right? He's crushed, so I don't have to be crushed. But we tell people that he was crushed, and then you got to take part in that crushing, so you're going to be crushed too. But that's not what he says. We are saved from his wrath through what Jesus did for us. Now, does that make anybody feel any better? <laughs> you're like, what? Okay, so he was crushed. Now, I want you to take all this in, all right? So what was his experience? Because I want you to understand that. Why, why do I have to get to this point with experience? Because until we understand what he experienced and what he did for us and the magnitude of that experience, how he overcame that, then it still has just become this fairy tale story to us. Go to Psalm chapter 22 really quick. <laughs> Psalm 22. By his crushing, we are healed. Come on, just tell yourself, by his crushing, I'm healed. I want to just tell you something. That's just, see, let me show you something. The Bible makes no difference in our life unless it becomes part of your heart. If it just stays in your mind as something and knowledge that you know about him, it does not do us any good. Why? Because it's not something you believe. It's something you adhere to or you agree to. And so what we have to do is we have to get it from our mind into where it's the core of our heart, where that's how we operate. See, most of the time in church, we're trying to live right because it's a right way to live when actually we don't believe that we want to live that way because we don't believe it's the best way. It's like, love your neighbor. Well, I don't really want to love them because I'd rather do this because it feels better, right? But we don't realize that loving them is a way better quality of life than revenge, but if I don't believe in the love of God and understand the love of God, this will feel way more, way more qualifying than loving them. Does that make sense? How many have ever been in an argument that's lasted for a long time, maybe over years where you've disagreed with somebody? And then you get to the point, you're like, I don't even know why we're mad. Why? Because I chose to allow this to be the thing that solved the life problem, to bring me more life when I actually missed out on life because I pushed them away from my life. Does that make sense? So what is the picture? Psalm 22. So what is the experience that Jesus went through? I want to read verse one to you. I'm going to correlate it back. Here's another messianic prophecy that is describing, this is what's so fascinating about the Bible. This was actually written about 600 years before Jesus ever walked the earth, okay? About 600 years before he ever walked the earth. And this is what's interesting about it. This is David writing a psalm and he is describing what Jesus is going to go through in his experience on the cross, all right? You're going to find these correlations. It's like, I'm going to take you back to the New Testament. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? I want you to look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, and he said it in that language, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's writing about the experience of how Jesus felt. So let me just give you an example. Why did Jesus yell that out? Okay, understand that Jesus has never been disconnected from his father. He's never been, never had sin nature, so he's never been afraid of God, his father. So for the first time in his existence, Jesus is on the cross and God has separated himself from him. And for the first time, Jesus is actually experiencing what it feels like for God to not be there. And he actually is saying this, why are you forsaking me? Where are you at? You guys ever been lost or been in the dark and you can't find somebody in your hall and you just get, you can't find them? How terrifying that is? So think about this. Jesus is on the cross. He's always known that God was there and now he can't find him, feel him, or hear him. And he's feeling the forsaking that is taking place because now he's becoming the sin for us. And part of that, becoming sin. Remember, sin can't be in the presence of God. So now God is removing himself from him. All right? Let's go to verse 6, and we're going to read down through verse 8. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me, they ridicule me. 
They shoot out their lips. They shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. I want you to flip over to Matthew chapter 27 once again. The next verse. Likewise, the chief priest also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him. Now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. So we see in the same correlations. This is the same experience that they prophesied about in Psalms that we're seeing Jesus experience on the cross. They were ridiculing him. They were making fun of him. Hey, you say you saved yourself. Why don't you save yourself from the cross then? Okay, here's the last one. Go to verse 14. I want you to look at verse 18. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart, so the reason why this is not true because David's bones were never all out of joint. Okay, so it's not referring to him. It's referring to a feeling that he is saying these out loud. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like pots hurt and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. How many knows that's exactly what happened when he was on the cross? Nailed him to the cross and they cast lots for his clothing. He's referring to his experience on the cross. David is prophesying and telling them this is what he will experience while he's up there. He said this, all my bones are out of joint. I don't know about, you guys ever knocked a bone out of joint? Or a, a, so when I was young, I pulled my elbow out of socket. Rough day. Rough day. Right? Young kid, elbow out of socket. I thought I was dying. And you know what's crazy about it? It hurt for a while. But now his experience is this, not just one, but every bone I have is out of joint. He said, I can see my, my ribs, all my bones, I can count them. Why? That's from the flogging. So you can see the experience. Now, why is all this taking place? It's because he's carrying the weight of sin, okay? Now, I don't know if you've seen somebody that's gone through a difficult part of their life, really challenging hard, how it changes the way they look. You guys ever know what I'm talking about? They've gone through something difficult. Uh, the weight of everything has been upon them. And then they just look like they've been through a lot. So you got to imagine, he is carrying every single thing. A lot of theologians believe, because it went pitch black at the time, that he actually became everything at that moment. And it was too grotesque to be seen. Matter of fact, they even said in prophecy, they said this, you can't tell if he's male or female, a man or a woman. Because of the, of the weight of that. It wasn't just they beat him to that point. He was carrying the weight of that sin. I know that's a lot. I know you're like, dear God, I got to eat lunch after this. But I say all that to tell you that this is the reason why we have to understand. Remember, my view is like this. He's just skinny Jesus on the cross. Listen, he was naked as you could be. There wasn't a loincloth around his waist. And they just were naked as you could get. Why? Because it was about being shamed. It wasn't about like, hey, we want you presentable. It's like, we want you to feel the most embarrassment and shame you can possibly experience. And he bore all that. Now, this is what's interesting. Let's go a little further. So every sin, every effect of that sin, he bore in him. Go to Romans chapter six, okay? He bore that in his body. Now, I need you to understand this part. So this is what that means. Every sickness that ever was ran its course through Jesus and in the end killed him means every cancer ran its course in his life and it killed him in the end. Every AIDS ran its course and it killed him. Every, every abuse ran its course and it killed Jesus in the end, all right? It wasn't like God is like, okay, let me take his heart. He's like, he carried the weight of all these things and then in the end, he, he fulfilled that because how many knows you can't be the penalty for a sin unless you carry that sin out? The effects of it, you die from it. And that's what he did. He bore all of that so we would not have to carry and that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to think about it. That's a, that's a weighty thing, right? Go to Romans chapter 6. Let me show you what I mean. Romans chapter 6. Now, I want you to also know this, that that three days, when he was buried for three days and three nights, that sin is what held him in the ground. It wasn't like Jesus was sitting down there and he had a watch and he was like, okay, I got 25 more hours and I'm coming out of this thing. 
He was separated from God. He could not experience him, hear him, or feel anything. Separated from him. And he is being held by these sins in the belly of the earth, the Bible says, for three days and three nights. Okay? And it's going to tell us how he was raised from the dead. It wasn't like, okay, that's enough. Let me just go ahead and pull you out of there. Okay? You're going to see what, why this works like this. Okay? Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And let me just tell you this. It wasn't the devil tormenting him for those three days and three nights. It was the separation from God that was tormenting him. Can I give you a little theological thing that's true about the devil? Is he is not living in hell. He's on the earth. He will never want to go to hell. He does not have a kingdom in hell. That's where he will be imprisoned for all eternity. So he's not like, that's not where he goes down and rule. You know how you see cartoons? He's like sitting on a throne down there with the pitchfork. It's not how that works. That's all Catholicism. With the, the, you got the Dante's Inferno, all those things. He's not sitting down there with a the throne. He is entombed in the earth until he will be defeated and he will be locked in, in prison for the eternity. So he does not want to go there because that's his end fate. So he is on the earth and he is looking to try to destroy whatever he can. Okay, so now we're seeing this kind of play itself out, right? So it wasn't him down there tormenting Jesus the whole time. The torment was being separated from the Father. Now here's, here's what it looks like, okay? This is all scriptural. So remember when the, the, there, was a, there was the lame man, Lazarus, and there was, there was the uh, lame at the feet of the rich man or the gate of the rich man? They both died. One went to Sheol, right? And then the other went to Abraham's bosom. That means there was like this huge gulf. On this side were those that were in, in Sheol. And this side were those that were waiting. They were in the Abraham's bosom or the righteous, right? And this guy was like, hey, you know, go tell my family uh, to believe in God because they don't want to come here, right? You guys remember this story? Okay, so Jesus was in this side of it. He was in Sheol, separated from the Father, I don't know if he could see a cross. I don't know what the story was, but he was separated from him with no experience or no presence of God. All right, so here's the picture. So you get the picture? He wasn't just hanging out waiting. He was in torment for those three days and three nights. Now, here's what you're going to see about Romans chapter 6, right? Romans chapter 6 is going to show us the truth that he had to use his faith to be resurrected. All right, Romans 6. Therefore, we were buried with him with baptism into death, right? That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. So Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. That word glory is a huge word that means like splendor, majesty. But the very first definition you're going to see is the word view and opinion. He was raised by the view and the opinion. So think about this. He was not just raised by the goodness of the glory of God. He was raised because of the view and the opinion that God had of him, right? We just read, and we're gonna read here in just a moment, that this is God's view and opinion of him, okay? So he knew he was gonna have to go suffer for all of our sin, okay? Psalm 16, flip over there real quick. You guys with me so far? Are you confused yet? Just pretend if you are. Psalm 16. See, now, why, why am I going to these links? Because in, in religion, we will just take what mom and dad said or our family has believed for generations and never look at why. I told you a few months back, second generation Christians are the toughest to, 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 to see life happen in because they've lived in an environment where they're trying to live according to a set of principles. They're trying to live a lifestyle without understanding the belief of that lifestyle. They've been to church all their life. They know they shouldn't cuss. They shouldn't swear. They shouldn't do all these things. So they try to do that without the understanding of belief. That's why they stay in church until they graduate from their parents' house and then they go wild. Why? Because it wasn't a belief in their heart. It was just a life that they were trying to adhere to. Why? Just because it's good to live that kind of life, right? So what we're trying to see is it has to become part of our belief of who we are. Not religion, but relational, all right? Romans chapter, or uh, Psalm chapter uh, 16. Here's another prophecy talking about, about Jesus and what would take place. Look at verse 9 through 11. It's our last verse, all right? Verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad and my, my, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, all right? Which is hell or Hades, the underworld. 
nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, I want you to, I want you to just understand. This was David writing this, or his, one of his songwriters were writing these psalms. So Jesus knew all of these. If you were a Jewish and you went through any type of their seminary, you knew these scriptures. They memorized them. So he knew this. So when he read that, you will not leave my soul, he knew that word. So he had to know it by memory. So you can imagine him being separated from God, not knowing what's going on. But in his memory, he knew this. He will not leave my soul in Sheol. He will not leave me in hell, nor will this body see corruption. So Jesus used his faith because this was the view and the opinion of God about him. And because he trusted in that, after three days and three nights, God raised him from the dead because Jesus clung to the view and the opinion of God about his life. And he carried that out. And he's been totally free from that. Conquering sin, death, and the grave. It wasn't like it was just like this preliminary thing. I'm going to act like I'm in jail for a while and then I'm going to come out of this thing. He literally bore the suffering that we would experience so we wouldn't have to. That's how good he is. And that's how much he loves us. So today what I want you to see is I want you to see that as his humanity, he was our example of how he lived. And he loved you and I so much that he took this on himself so that we would never have to experience that in our life ever. So no matter what you're carrying right now, you're probably carrying some things just like I am, that through his death, burial, and his resurrection that he already paid for. You know, it'd be like this. It'd be like someone coming into your life, all the debt that you had, they come in and said, listen, I want to pay for all of Josh's debts for all time. Matter of fact, I know he owes like, let's say he owes $100,000. i am going to pay for all that, but I'm going to put $60 million in his account so that if anything ever else happens, he's covered for that. I just threw a big number out there. Why? Now, it'd be in like this. My debts are paid. But what if you never went to the bank to find that out? And you just kept paying and kept paying and kept paying because you owed this and you just kept paying all your life. And you continue to pay for it. You're stressed out. You're living under all this pressure to make those bills every single week and it's already been paid for in full. That's what the church is like. Jesus did all of it so that you and I could be the righteousness of God. That means Righteousness means as it should be. So we could live as we should get to live. But the enemy is, the enemy, and I'm going to say this too, the church, we've done so good, not intentionally, the church, not intentionally. We did it because we're trying to help people, but we put so much on trying to please the Lord that we didn't realize that he was already pleased through what Jesus did for him. Does that make sense? Jesus did it all. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. So he's not mad at you. I know you've probably been told he's mad at you. He's not mad at you. God is not stressed out in heaven thinking, I don't know what's going on in this earth. He knows exactly what's going on. The reality of it is, is he's already solved the problem. But the church has to preach the good news and not religion to people because it doesn't change them. It just binds heavier weights on them. I want you to stand to your feet. Stand to your feet this morning. Yeah, Josh, but he spoke that about Jesus. You know, he spoke that he spoke those things, that view and opinion he had was about Jesus, that, you know, he, he wouldn't leave his soul in corruption. He wouldn't do this. You know, that's his, his, his promise to him. But the thing about this, guys, is this. This entire book is full of his promises. Not only the promises that were made to Jesus, it says this, we are joint heirs with Christ. That means if it's his, that we jointly have the same access to that. We are his brothers. We are his brethren. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. We have the same access to every promise. So what do we do? We take a hold of those promises and by the glory and the view or the opinion of God or the reality of God, we come out of those places, those things that we've been in bondage for years. You ever wondered how you're ever going to get out of that? Can I tell you this? In this room, every single person in this room has something that you struggle with every single day that would be considered sin. Whoa, hey, hey, preacher. See, there's things that, that are sin, quote, unquote, sin, that we wouldn't even realize are sinful. 
but their acts of distrust or their acts of unbelief. Remember this, anything that is unbelief is sin. So anything I do that is not trusting in God is actually sinful or actually it's not connecting me to as it should be. You, you see that I'm different? See, we, Jesse talked on this a few weeks ago about the word sin because we're so sin-minded and sin-conscious. We are the word sin. We think about all the actions. Sin means this, you're missing the mark. Righteousness means this, you're living as it should be. You see the difference? Am I missing the mark? What mark? The mark as it should be. See, when I talk about depression, he doesn't want you depressed. Why? Because as it should be, he wants you to be whole and healed and enjoying the rest of your life. Why? Because that moment is not the end of the earth for you. That moment is not hopeless. Why? Because he's full of hope. But it takes, it takes believing that and letting it become part of you and who you are. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. I want you to do a little something with me. Anybody here ever play sports? Maybe, maybe you didn't play sports. It's okay. You've probably done this before. Where you've actually visualized something. You actually, what we would, the Bible calls it, you would meditate or you would see. But I want you to do this. I want you to cl close your eyes and I want you to just see life how it should be. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be hard for some of you to do that this morning because you're looking at yourself through such a bad lens. But if you could have any life, I want you to just begin to look at life as it should be. Man, I look at my life and I just see smiles on my face. Why? Because there's a lot of days I don't want to smile. Because I'm carrying the weight of something. And let me just say this to you. I'm carrying the weight of something that Jesus already carried the weight for. And I'm still carrying it. Because in my heart, I've not yet come to the place of saying, God, I trust you enough to let loose of this thing because even this bondage makes me feel comfortable sometimes. It makes me feel like I'm accepted or at least noticed. So I want you to see life as it should be. And let me tell you this, you know what's cool about seeing life as it should be is you're gonna start to feel feelings right now of how it would feel to have that. And let me tell you, that's how scripture works. Once your feelings come into alignment with what you see in the word of God, it will become part of who you are. But most of the time when we hear about forgiveness, freedom, we don't have emotions connected to that. We have emotions connected to our unworthiness and the fact that we're not good enough. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna begin the process of shifting that. It's called renewing our mind. Transformation comes through renewing our mind. So this morning I want you to see life as it should be. Come on, just begin to see it. I don't care if you have to get the largest picture of your mind, walking, you walking around total debt free, just, just, oh my gosh, so good. Let me just tell you this. Jesus trusted in the view opinion of God, the view and the opinion of God, even when he couldn't feel him there. So let me just tell you this. Even when you can't feel him or sense him there, he's there. He's never leaving you. He's never forsaking you. No matter what you face, he'll always be there. Father, I pray right now for this room. I know that it's been kind of a crazy, a lot of information this morning, but I, I believe, Lord, that you're doing something right now within our hearts, that we are seeing the truth of you carrying that. I want you to see Jesus carrying whatever it is right now that you're experiencing, the weight and the heaviness of a sickness, the weight and heaviness of a disease, the weight and heaviness of depression, the weight and heaviness of, of financial lack. I want you to see him carrying the weight of that in his body on that tree. Yeah, but pastor, I made some bad decisions that brought me here. Listen, he didn't say it's based on your decisions. He said he carried it all. They're all based on our decisions. So just see him carrying that right now. Father, I thank you that you bore all of my issues in your body on that tree so that I can be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That I can live in life as it should be and not in the life that I am living right now. That I can live in a life with the joy of the Lord as it should be, with peace as it should be, with health as it should be, with freedom as it should be. 
And we thank you for what you've done for us. I pray this morning, Jesus, as we go through our life, that we will constantly reflect on how great your sacrifice was for us. And we receive it today. And we thank you for it. In your son's name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Come on, I know that's a heavy thing. Jesse, come on up here. So we're going to continue to dig on this. And as Jesse comes up here, I'm just going to let you know, there's all kinds of scriptures that lays back to this. I'm going to even go even more depth about this. You know, it says uh, the only sign that would be given would be this, the sign of Jonah. You guys probably read this in Matthew. And the sign of Jonah was he spent three days and three nights in the belly of a what? Well, guess what Jesus did? Spent three days and three nights in the belly of the... Read Jonah and find out what Jonah did while he was talking to God in the belly of the, in the, belly of the, of the well. And you're going to get a picture of what Jesus did when he was in the belly of the earth. It's amazing what he did. He began to speak to himself in a way to remind him of who God was and what God thought of him. It's unbelievable. But it, that's how he came out of that grave. Because after, remember, after, after Jonah did that, guess what happened? What did, what did that well do? Spit him back on the earth. Guess what your sickness will do? It'll spit you out of it. Think about that. Why? Because it can no longer hold you. Because you believe the view and the opinion of God about yourself. Let's take that. I'm telling you, it's good stuff. God is so good. Amen? Oh, you, Jesse. So you sit you sit there and you think about and you hear about all the things that Jesus did and, and you try to, you know, you try to make sense of it and you try to, you know, put it together and like, why? What, what, what did he see? I mean, I mean, I'm not, I know I'm not the only one that's just, you know, stood, stood in front of a mirror looking at yourself and meditating on the things that Jesus, Jesus did on your behalf and just go, but why? But why? What is there here? You know, and the, the point is, is like, we don't, we don't know all the good things that he sees in our lives and all the things that he has laid out before us, but he wants us to be able to, and I was thinking about this as you come up, and he wants us to be able to be at peace, have a place of peace. And I was thinking about that, and, you know, th there's a scripture, in, in the, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it says, let peace be your guide. And the thing is, is a lot of the times whenever you're living, you know, you're living your life trying to be your own um, uh, price payer, I get, you see what I'm saying? You're trying to pay your own price and trying to work things out on your own and, and you know, be what Jesus has already done for you. You're, you're not at peace with that because it just doesn't feel right. And the reason it doesn't feel right is because we're not supposed to live in that. We're supposed to live in the peace that what Jesus has already done. And, you know, and that's that scripture where he goes back to let peace be your guide. Whenever you're in that situation, you know, I feel like a thing to do is to take a step back and say, I don't, I don't have any peace about this. And I'm just not going to I'm just not going to go down that path, and I'm just going to accept what Jesus did and roll with that. That's good stuff right there. That is, that is I, that's a lot of information to think about and to meditate about, but I feel like we have got to get it real in our heart what Jesus did and how significant we really are to him. I think that was awesome. So as we leave here today, we can leave in confidence that, he, we were valuable to him, and just go out into this world and and try to be a try to be a blessing to each and every person that we come in contact with, and because there is they're that important to him too. Let's pray, Lord Jesus. We give you honor and we give you glory. We just thank you for your love and for your goodness. We thank you that you looked into our lives and you saw the person that we are, the things that we would do, and the, and the uniqueness that we carry with us, Lord Jesus, and that you saw significant enough value in who we were to be able to come to this earth and pour yourself out for us so that we could live in that place of as we should be. And we just give you honor and we give you glory. We thank you that as we leave this place, that we would go out and we would share the same love that you had for us with each and every person that we interact with. And we just give you glory and we give you honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.